Hey everybody. Uh, my name is Susan M. Hart Servideo. I am one of the horticulturists at the Rutgers uh, Cooperative Extension in Ocean County. And um, tonight we're talking TikTok, uh, giving you some tips on tick safety, tick ID, and talking a little bit about the diseases. But since we are not medical personnel, um, we really um, cannot speak uh, what's the best option for you or how to take care of it. You'd want to speak with a medical professional for that. So. Um, Tonight with me as well is uh, Patty Dixon, who is also one of the horticulturists at the at the extension, and um, hopefully Teresa Becker, who is one of our assistants in the office, is going to um, pop on and uh, help answer some questions. And so um, I do have some question breaks. I have three, so um, we can try to reach um, as many of those questions as we can. Again, if for some reason uh, we don't get to it, we can. Um, I will have a. Uh, a list where you can send us your email and send us your question separate. At the end of this program, we do have a questionnaire that'll pop up. So when I shut the program or when the program is shut down, the uh, questionnaire will pop up. If you want to fill it in, you can put your questions in there. We can uh, we can answer after. And also then when we we will be recording this, uh, we are recording it, and we will be sending the link and uh, two handouts, um, possibly three handouts that um, will go with it with the uh, link recording so that you can watch it at another time. And everybody will get that, anybody that has registered, even if you were unable to attend tonight. So I just wanted to also let you know that your video microphones and the chat features have been disabled. So we will be using the Q&A feature to ask your questions. And uh, those questions will go to Patty and Teresa. They will answer as they can. And the answers of uh, the questions and those answers will pop up. So you will be able to read those as as the program goes. And, and uh, please join us if you haven't uh, registered. You can join us for our guide to growing beautiful roses with our master gardeners, Mary Townsend and Linda Convey will be giving um, the uh, next program in on May 16th. So you can join us then. So. Let me there we go. Um, so again. Um, I'm Susan, <laughs> um, and I just wanted to um, show you we do have all our programming is equal opportunity programs uh, for providers and employers. So if you do have any questions or have any special needs, you can always contact us um, and let us know it. Then we can make as uh, what arrangements um, we can to make it work for you guys, as well as providing this information at a later date if necessary. So um, we again, thank you for joining us. And um, our Rutgers Cooperative Extension is a NJAES stands for New Jersey Agriculture Experiment Station. Our extension mission is to bring out the research based information to the public uh, in informal education, such as publications in this lecture. And then we do have uh, extension does include 4 H marine commercial fisheries and aquaculture in Ocean County. We do have that at ours. Um, and uh, we have agriculture and horticulture, which would be my section. We have natural resources, water management, family and commun uh, community health sciences, nutrition education, and usually our master gardener helpline is open. Um, it is still, you can call that number and you will get um, either Patty or myself and we can answer those questions and you can always um, check out our website if I copied it correctly, I will fix that. This should be uh, HTTPS um, <laughs> in there for our website. If you have any questions, you can always contact us through our website. So I have a little tick trivia and I know you guys aren't really gonna be able to put the questions, uh, the answers in there, but I just wanted to, you know, you can answer to yourselves. Um, is it true or false that ticks jump? And the answer is false, ticks do not jump. Um, the only disease that ticks can transmit is Lyme. Do you think that's true or false? And as you will learn in this program, oops, my things are not working, my buttons hitting the wrong buttons, it's false. Um, there are other diseases that ticks can transmit. And also, um, so actually this is kind of a silly question, all ticks can transmit disease, that is true. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever cannot, or can be contracted in New Jersey, and that is true. And a lot of people think that that's only on the western side of the United States, but no, it's actually more prevalent here uh, on the east coast, to be honest. So, and so southern southern states and the east coast. And uh, best recommendation for removing tick is to use Vaseline. And I hit the button too quick. Um, that is false, and we'll discuss why. And at the Rutgers Cooperative Extension, we get this question a lot: um, Do we test tick or we test ticks? And we do not. 
we only identify. And we do have a list of the laboratories, tick testing laboratories, um, short list. Um, so if you have any questions or you want to just send the tick out for testing, you can contact us and we will send you the list of labs uh, that you can contact and then you send the uh, client sends the tick out. So we'll kind of go on uh, what's, what's the purpose of ticks? What do they serve? So they are a food source um, for other animals, opossums, uh, uh, birds, reptiles, amphibians. Um, wild turkeys, chickens, guinea hen or guinea fowl, uh, western fence lizards, which here in the east, I don't believe we have western fence lizards. However, um, that is, uh, they are a source. There are other ticks that um, are around the United States, um, but we are going to talk about the ones that are most common here in the northeast um, in the mid-Atlantic states. Um, and why do they bite? Uh, they need their blood or they need, they need our blood or blood of an animal uh, to molt into their different stages and then to reproduce. So they do serve a purpose, may not, obviously does not um, go and coincide with what we prefer, but they do, uh, they do have a, a purpose, a uh, circle of life. And uh, what do ticks do? Um, so they climb or crawl. They do not fall out of trees and they don't jump or fly. So that's always something we get. Oh, I walked under a tree. It must have jumped out of the tree. No, it did not. Um, very rarely could it possibly happen. Could it fall off an animal, a bird? That's a, possibly, but usually that is not the case. They're usually climbing up from the ground. And um, as you can see in these pictures, um, they're actually on blades, grass, um, and they feed off a host animals uh, or humans. And they do this thing with their front forelegs and they, it's called questing. They put their four legs up and that's how they sense um, your CO2 trends, uh, your CO2 emissions and also um, some vibration. Uh, so that's how they sense that something's nearby. Where's my, you know, I need to grab on. And every, um, they have four sets of legs um, and every uh, leg is tipped with a claw. So that's how they grab on very easily. If even if you just barely brush against them. So um, that's why they are very tenacious. So there are four stages of ticks. Uh, excuse me, of the life stages of a tick. And you have the egg, larval, nymph, and adult. So we're gonna start with the larva stage. Larva feeds on a host. It drops off to the ground and then molts into a nymph. It only has one meal. It doesn't drop off one and go into another person uh, as a larva. It just has one meal to get to, to, to be able to molt into the nymph. And then as a nymph, the nymph seeks out a second host um, or another host and feeds on, um, feeds on them and also drops to the ground and molts into an adult. And as an adult, the male and female adults seek out, seek out a third host. They feed, mate, and drop off to the ground where the males usually die soon after, sorry, uh, while females eventually lay eggs on the soil, uh, on the soil or on leaf litter on usually uh, some surface on the ground. Um, egg laying may last up to several days to a few weeks. And ticks, depending on the species, can lay anywhere from 1,500 eggs to 5,000. So that is why, you know, sometimes you see such numbers um, and it, it can seem like, where did they come from all of a sudden? Um, they are tiny and uh, they are prolific when they can be. So um, the life cycle itself can take up to two years to complete, depending on the tick, uh, the tick species. And um, most of our ticks are usually about two years uh, through their life cycle. And uh, there are three main species that in New Jersey that impact humans. So there are a lot of other species of ticks out there, but those that impact humans is what we're concentrating on. Uh, the American dog tick, uh, uh, Dermacenter, Dermacenter, I can never say it correctly, sorry, uh, Variabilis, the Lone Star tick, uh, Ablionoma, Ablioma americanum, and the black-legged tick, the deer tick, Exodes scapularis. And there is a fourth species that can impact humans, but it's usually more on pets, and that's the brown dog tick. And I'm not going to butcher that one, so I'm just going to skip that Latin name. Um, but the brown dog tick is, uh, looks similar to the American dog tick, and I'll show you those pictures. So here are some close-ups of what the ticks can look like. And the American dog tick, what we're looking at, we don't see the larva or the nymph form, so you can kind of keep those guys out of your... Obviously, they do happen because that's what they need in order to go through their cycle. But what comes into our... Um, our office for ID is uh, adults, 
and uh, the adult female, or excuse me, male and female. So you can see that these guys have a uh, really white marbleization on the male. The whole body is its shield. Um, so the marbleization is the whole body. Uh, it has these festoons, it's called festoons on the bottom. And then here on the female, she has this white shield behind her mouth parts. These are the mouth parts. Um, and she, um, she has the belly or the abdomen that can expand and then that's when we see uh, fat as a tick so um, there are some great resources the tick encounter resource center is out of massachusetts uh, right now i'm not sure if the tick encounter is uh, open with uh, covid and whatnot so um, i do need to check the links on those but they are normally uh, great for information on finding out um, where the ticks are and uh, what's up and coming with these ticks. So here are some uh, actually under the scope um, in the microscope at the in the office. So here's a female tick on the top side and her underside. And um, here's one that has been uh, engorged and full of blood and she's actually laying eggs. This is a female tick and her eggs come out of this little pouch right down here. So it's just kind of cool. We just had to put that in there to kind of grow. Sorry, hopefully you're finished eating dinner and no, it's not caviar. So um, the uh, the eggs that they, they are very prolific. Um, this uh, young lady, I guess I would call her, uh, was um, in a bag that somebody had uh, brought some ticks into uh, BID and uh, we forgot that we had them in the baggie. And it's funny, I had put the time on it to date uh, 29 days she laid eggs and she was alive. So that was pretty uh, disgusting, but pretty cool too at the same time. So our next tick is the Lone Star tick. So uh, the Lone Star tick is actually one of the most common ticks that we have in in, um, in Ocean County. And again, throughout New Jersey, I know um, normally they are a Southern tick, but with our temperatures changing and we're becoming warmer, the ticks are moving more northward. And I do believe they have found some of these guys in um, Massachusetts, Connecticut area as well. Um, I don't know if they're as far west as Ohio yet. I forgot to check that. So I don't wanna give any false information, but here in New Jersey, they're definitely here. Um, that is actually the most common tick that we do have come into the office. Um, oops, and I wanted to go, let me just, sorry, go back one second. So in here, we do see all four stages, uh, three stages. We have the larva. The larva has six legs. Um, the nymph stage, which is the second stage, uh, the teenage, they have four legs, but they do not have any coloration on their shield, and they have a nice moon-shaped belly. And then you have your males. This is a um, the male tick again. The whole body is kind of shiny. It's a shield. It can't expand. Um, and this is a little bit of reflection here, but they do have white markings down here on this festoons or the bottom end of the shield that usually lets us. Um, it's pretty much indicative of that we have a male tick. And I'll tell you why that uh, becomes comes into play a little bit more when we start talking about disease and disease transmission. And the adult female. She, this is how she got her, this is how they got their name, the Lone Star Tick, the single star on the back at the bottom end of their shield. Their shield uh, shape is kind of like a home plate, it's triangular. So that's what we're looking for when we're trying to ID and they have these uh, longer mouth parts and they have more crab-like appearance with their legs, but they are one of the fastest ticks to move uh, in the humans ones that we're worried about. They tend to just go uh, and it's like all of a sudden it's like, whoa, where are you? You know, where'd you come from? Obviously, you just were in the in the grass two seconds ago, and now they're halfway up your body. So, um, these are the guys you want to. They're one of the ones you want to keep an eye out for. So again, here's some uh, pictures. Again, the reason we added some pictures from the microscope is so that you can see that not everything is perfect textbook. Sometimes we get stuff um, that comes in and um, they're ripped apart. So um, I just wanted to show you that you know, physically, this is what it would look like rather than seeing those perfect pictures in the textbooks. Are online. So here's a female with her white dot. She has the festoons, these these markings down at the bottom. Those festoons don't really do anything, but they help us as an ID feature. The male, here's the male. He's got white markings. You can see some flecking, white flecking here. There's markings here. Sometimes the markings will be up a little bit higher on the tick. And then the nymphs and the larva, they do not have any, um, whoops, sorry, my, I keep forgetting I have a trigger, a trigger figure. Uh, the nymphs do not have any, um, do not have the white dot 
they are not sexed. They have not uh, matured into a sexual reproduction stage at this point. Um, so they do not have any, uh, we just call them nymphs, but they, um, again, you can really see that triangular shape. They're amber in color. And here's one fully engorged. So here's the shield. That same size shield is right here. So it gets pushed up um, when it's full of blood. So you can see they really do Sorry, they really do expand and get engorged. And then the larva, um, which is the bottom one, um, they're very translucent when they're first out of the egg. So um, that's another uh, ID feature. And they also have three sets of legs on each side. So I know I'm going a little bit into detail, but we get so many questions as to what kind of tick is it and, and why, um, or how can I tell? Because some people want to, you're out in the woods a lot and you do encounter ticks. So the black like a tick, which is um, the one most people are more familiar with or more worried about because it does, uh, it is a Lyme disease carrier. Um, you can see the larva stage here. Um, this is the nymph stage. So again, the larva stage has the three legs uh, on either side. So six, three pairs, six legs. The nymph and the adults have eight legs, four pair. Um, their shield is uh, much more uh, black. They tend to be uh, black in color or dark gray. You can see the male has this, again, his whole body is kind of shiny. It's a harder shield. It can't expand. And then here's the female. The female um, and the nymphs are the two big ones that we're always worried about when we see these coming in and, you know, especially when we see them engorged and we'll talk about that. Uh, but here is, you can see the shield is more like a watermelon seed. So you have this darker shield and then you have this amber color body. So it's really two toned for the female. And that is a, a pretty uh, good um, indication of which tick you have. And then there are other features, which, you know, if you really guys want to really know, uh, I'll get you there. But our master gardeners in Ocean County, we do train our master gardeners to recognize the identification features of each tick so that um, they can help ID the ticks um, when we're back in session and they are able to come in and volunteer again. So here are some pictures, the female. The male, this is the underside. So another key identification feature is kind of gross, but it's anal, this is the anus and the anal ridge on a black legged tick is upside down. It's an upside down U. So that is one of the features we use as well as these, oh, yeah, these uh, mouth parts that are like sails. So um, that is one of the things, but you can see here's a, an adult female and here are two adult females engorged. So you can see how big they can get. Um, these guys were this size way back when, or before they uh, had fed. And so here's another one that you can see a little bit more under the light that's fully engorged. When they're fully engorged, they will um, take out their mouth part and uh, drop off. And then that's when they drop off of a person or an animal and drop into the leaf litter and then um, hopefully then go and lay their eggs if they are able to. And again, we're more concerned in the adult stage with the females. And this is just a quick, uh, the brown dog tick. So you can just see again, here's the four, uh, three stages with the male and the female. The female, her shield isn't as easy to see in here. The black striping um, or markings, I believe is more of the uh, blood, the inside you're sort of seeing through the ticks. Um, we don't see these. Um, we had seven come in a couple of years ago uh, off a dog that was um, uh, rescued from Puerto Rico and, um, they quarantined the dog for diseases, but not for ticks. Um, but uh, so there was a lot of, uh, she just brought in seven. So we've seen them, but I have not, I really would have to uh, look at that um, and compare it into uh, using a key to figure out if it was, if I had another one of these guys come in. And the other one that caught the people's attention in the last couple of seasons um, has been the Asian longhorn tick. Um, right now, um, or as of 20, I believe in early 2020, we did not have any um, known um, tick bites from these that transmitted disease. So the, the big worry was here, they so, uh, scientists uh, found these ticks and they're worried that they're gonna not only transmit diseases that we already have here in the United States, but bring over um, or introduce the Asian, um, uh, I believe it's Asian spotted fever. 
Um, and that is something that, that we were worried about that that was going to happen. And so far that has not. Um, they have found them on people, but not actually biting and attached. They seem to be more on livestock. So um, right now I couldn't find a better update on information with COVID. Everything kind of went a little different. Um, and um, so hopefully the research will be um, back up and running uh, a little bit more smoothly with more information that we can pass on in another time. But this is the tick stages all together, so you get an idea of size. So here is your black legged tick, which is the smallest. Then you have the lone star ticks. And you can see those. Here's a dime, and here's the D in dime. So you can see how tiny these can be. These can be as small as a freckle um, or even just a flake of skin. You don't, don't know what it is until you see. Hopefully, you don't see it move. But if you see it move, um, you know, you can try to get that. Uh, get, get a hold of it and get it out of there, get it off. And the American dog tick is one of our larger ticks um, that we see come in. So sometimes size helps, but it only helps if you have something to compare it to. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, um, Patty, I don't know if uh, Teresa's on, if you guys have any questions that might come up be before we go in. Um, so actually there's no questions. Okay. And. Um, Teresa is here, but I can't bring her in as a panelist. Oh, okay. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, sorry, Teresa. We'll I'll try to we'll try to figure that out. But I want to do um so yeah, if you guys do have questions, please um pass them on. But we're gonna talk about tick habitat and why that now, okay, we turn, learned about the ticks, what's their habitat and how to um prevent bites. So um what the ticks need for survival is moisture and humidity. They like the shadier areas rather than being in the hot sun. Obviously, they will dry up and get crispy. Um, edges of woods is where you're going to find them more likely, more likely to find them um, with vegetation and leaf litter. They're not usually found in middle uh, of open, uh, taken care of areas. So the middle of your lawn, um, you know, if you have a rather large lawn or a playing field, are usually not in the middle of the field that you are going to find them. There's always exceptions to the rule, but on a whole, that is not the case. Um, you would find them more on the outer edges. Um, area where deer and mice live, the deer and the mice are the carriers of um, the ticks and they're in their younger stages a lot of times. Sometimes they will get onto us in their young stages, but usually in their larva and their nymph stages. Um, the mice are a big player in carrying the disease and giving, you know, once the ticks are feeding on the mice, that's where they pick up the diseases. Um, not all of them, but that's a place you'd find them. Uh, so they also need a host in order to survive the ticks and brown dog ticks can live indoors. So that's why uh, vets do tend to see them a little bit more often than we do um, here in the office. So tick prevention, um, big thing is a lot of people now, now that we're into spring, it's not as, as a, a concern because now all the ticks are out, but black legged ticks are more active in the fall and can be active even in the winter time, uh, especially when the temperatures, uh, the ground temperatures are above 45 and air temperatures are above freezing. So if you um, are out or go out in, in the woods on a nice day in the winter, in the winter time, you know, be aware that it's possible that you might um, encounter some ticks. You wanna be extra cautious coming into May, June and July are the three main months that all the ticks can be active and quite of uh, almost all the stages can be found um, as well, except for the American dog tick. We only see the adults. Um, but they are, uh, for us in Ocean County, they are the highest months for counts of ticks. Um, April, we just did our tick count for April. We had 72 ticks that we identified. And I, off the top of my head, I want to say 35 of them were um, Lone Star. I believe there were 20 that were American, um, were, uh, excuse me, uh, deer tick, and then the rest were American dog ticks. So. You know, they are out um, and the numbers are just going to go up from here um, in February, March and February. We had 12 <laughs> ticks, so um, we weren't expecting, you know, we, we were expecting a change and it, it's happening. So when you're out in the woods, you want to, um, if you can, wear light colored clothing. And the reason light colored clothing is it is so that you can see the ticks if they're on you. They'd stand out a little bit more so you can get them before they attach or before they get under your clothing. Um, go with long sleeves if it's possible, you know, long sleeves uh, so that and tighter at the cuffs, not open sleeves where they could go up and under. Um, have your pants uh, tucked into your socks or into your boots so that the ticks have to crawl up and over rather than up and under your uh, 
your pants or your pant leg. So um, that is why you want to do that. It does not make a beautiful fashion statement. However, um, fashion statement or health, these are some things you, you have to make some considerations. And we will talk about some other uh, repellents and things that you can do. Um, keep, your, uh, keep to the center of trails as much as you can to minimize contact with adjacent vegetation. Uh, dogs, when you're walking your dogs, obviously, you know, those guys go all over the place. So, um, you know, check your dogs as well when you come in after. Um, well, actually, I have it in the next slide here. So as a repellent, you can use deep Picardin uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus. And there's uh, one other tick repellent that's a possibility. You want to make sure that if you are using something uh, for, as a repellent that it is labeled for ticks and that, um, you know, if you have a, you want to check and make sure that you follow all label directions on how to apply it. And um, depending on the product, the um, efficacy, which we'll talk about the, the, uh, the way it works and how long it works, um, we'll talk about some of the differences there. You can treat clothing with a permethrin based uh, tick repellent. And I'll talk about that again in the next uh, section after this. You want to inspect your clothing and entire body carefully for to remove any attached ticks. Ticks can, uh, pets can bring the ticks into the home. So you want to, again, keep an eye on your pets, but monitor the ticks. You can monitor the ticks in your yard by performing a tick drag. And uh, Patty and I um, wound up doing a tick drag last week. Um, we did a trial run to kind of skit, you know, get you guys an idea. So we did a little video on Facebook. So if you guys are, um, this is the link, but you can go on RCE of Ocean County, or RCE Ocean County Facebook, and you can look up and watch the little five minute video. And we talk about how to make a tick drag and the point of a tick drag is so that when you have this sheet or this uh, cloth that's going to drag across the ground, you're going to do it in a simple grid light pattern so that you can keep an, uh, you know, you know where you've gone. And after a certain point, you're going to flip over the and see, uh, flip over the material that's laying on the ground and see if there are any, any ticks. So you're going to be looking at this material for ticks. If you don't find it, Turn it back over and go down to the next section until you see. So this, the reason I bring this up a little bit more and a lot of people really liked it, we actually had a lot of people view it, um, was that to so many people just want to spray their yards for ticks and mosquitoes and just spray, spray, spray. Well, if you don't have ticks, why are you going to spray? Um, you're just going to kill other things and it may not be effective and you're wasting your money. If you don't have ticks in your yard, don't spray for ticks. Um, so again, the you know, I'm not going to be on a soapbox or anything. You have to do what's right for you and the health of you and your family. Um, so I understand. However, you know, don't spray it if you don't need to, you know, keep our environment in mind as well. So again, if you, anybody, we can always send the link uh, later um, as part of our uh, recording too, if you guys are interested in watching that video. So when you're checking for ticks, you're checking your body. Um, how do you do it? Uh, what? Well, I shouldn't say how do you do it, but <laughs> you want to check. You want to make sure con uh, you conduct a full body check. You want to make sure you check in the hair, especially with children, um, at boys and girls, but the girls with longer hair, the hair swings a lot easier. They're lower to the ground, the children, so they're easier to pick up ticks. So you want to definitely look around the hairline, behind the ears, um, in the ear if that is a concern. Um, but usually anywhere in the facial, uh, you know, around the hairline and then, and also in the center, anywhere in that the ticks can hide. Um, you can use a handheld or full length mirror to view all body parts. Um, you can use the country song. I forget who it's by, but uh, you can check someone for ticks and uh, have at it from there. You can also, um, you know, when you're going and, and you're, you're getting a shower, you can feel, do you have a bigger lump? Is there a new freckles or something? You know, check those out because it may be a tick um, because they are tiny. And don't forget to check your belly button and groin area, areas that might be harder to look uh, or see easily by yourself. So again, armpits, groin, legs, behind the knees, behind the knees is a big one, and between your toes, as gross as that sounds, yes, between your toes, especially if you're a flip-flop wearer in the woods. Oops. Um, and so you can see down here in this picture, at the bottom of the person picture, there are sizes of some of the ticks. So here is a little larva or actually a nymph, they're saying, uh, and then you have an uh, adult female uh, American dog tick and an adult deer tick on the side, so you can see the size difference. So yeah, they, they, they're, they find their ways to get in if they can, and I have worked in the garden where I have found um, 
I looked down and I saw my legs look like they were moving. Uh, and I did, I had walked into a, uh, or I guess I came upon an egg mass. Uh, we call it a nest, even though it's not really a true nest. And uh, yeah, yeah, I freaked out. <laughs> and I'm brushing them off. I'm okay with ticks as long as they're not on me. But uh, I got rid of those. I finished up the landscaping I was doing. And uh, an hour later, I was like, okay, in my mom's kitchen, mom, look, I had five attached. So, you know, always check. Um, and uh, I did not have my repellents on, but here are some repellents. I pictured some things here. I am not promoting any names. Rutgers does not give any endorsement to any of these products. I just was trying to make it easy so you guys have a visual of what things you can find when you're at the store, box store, home store, garden centers, you know, you can find them. Uh, a lot of times when you are looking, you wanna look in the camping section. Um, you can definitely find lots of sunscreen, but sometimes the bug sprays, uh, the repellents are a little bit harder. So the repellents, the idea is that you're wearing it on your skin. Um, so it needs to have skin contact, whoops, skin contact. Um, so you have DEET, Picardin, IR3535 is one of those oddball ones, not something you're looking for, but when you're looking at your active ingredients on the label, it'll say these are the active ingredients that is uh, the purpose you're buying this product. Um, oil of lemon eucalyptus, you don't want to use that under children uh, three and under, and then the uh, paramethane uh, diol. I have not seen that one in trade, but uh, they're also suggesting you do not use that on three-year-olds or under, and this uh, two under canone, I hadn't seen that one either. So the most, the, the, the four readily available ones that you would find in the stores easier is the DEET, the Picardin, IR35, and the oil of lemon eucalyptus. Um, and uh, the lemon uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus is the more um, organic version. Um, you know, people say, can I use cinnamon oil? Can I use, we can't suggest that you use something that does not have, that is not on the label for that use. So um, we cannot suggest, uh, the horticulturists or anybody in extension, uh, Rutgers extension, we cannot suggest that you try something else um, that is not labeled for tick use, uh, for tick repellent use. Um, for clothing, uh, this is just a can, that doesn't matter whose brand it is, but permethrin, you want to check for the active ingredient on the can. And this is something that you would treat clothing only. This does not get on your skin. You do not spray your skin with this. It's treatment of clothing only. So you would treat your clothing, let it dry, and then, um, you know, by following the label instructions, and then you can wear it. Um, it is, uh, wear your clothing, excuse me. Uh, usually the minimum, I believe you can have up to seven washings um, for most of the different uh, brands that have this product. Sometimes you can go to like Dick's Sporting Goods or any outdoor stores and you can find some products that are already like, especially socks um, and uh, long pants that uh, are already have this product. Um, and it's someone actually in another program I was at, I said an Army Navy store or, or an outdoor, um, you know, uh, places where you have the uh, woodsman stores or, or fishing, um, fishing stores and things like that, that you would be able to get clothing that already has this on it. And then you would just follow the label. When you do wash your clothing, this clothing that you have this treatment on, you do not want to wash it with your regular laundry. You do want to wash it separate. Okay. And, but again, follow all the label instructions. Um, I won't belabor that too much. Um, and when you're doing tick removal, so you have a tick, you found one. Now, what do you do? You don't want to use matches, grease, Vaseline, alcohol, um, those four products specifically, um, because what happens is you are trying to, th those things will cause the tick to get agitated and possibly regurgitate you, the blood that they've taken in and their con stomach contents back into you. And most of these diseases uh, are found in the tick's gut. So there's, there's one or two exceptions, but for the most part, it's found in the tick's gut. So um, if you're expelling the stuff back, if it's expelling back into you, you're more likely to possibly hasten the transmission. So your fingers, the problem is that our fingers are, are, are fat and you can't, those tiny, those ticks are tiny. So what happens is you wind up grabbing that fat belly. So you wind up squishing the tick and pushing that blood back into you instead of um, just removing the tick. So we'll talk about how to do that. And again, so why, because it can cause a tick to regurgitate. And so you do want to use needle nose tweezers because they're tinier and, or a tick removing device. So when using, uh, um, a tweezer, you want to grab it as close as you can to the um, histoma, which is the mouth part that is uh, goes into your skin. Um, and you want to cut, oh, sorry, I have to figure out some way of 
moving my mouse around a little bit better. Sorry about that. Um, you want to get it as close to your skin, almost pulling your skin so that you're just getting the mouth parts of the tick and you're going to um, get it uh, to, uh, with, the, uh, with the tweezers and pull upward. Don't twist it. Don't turn it. Don't just yank it. Um, you know, kind of be as calm as possible. I know sometimes that can be difficult, uh, especially when you either have squirming children or you're kind of squeamish about it yourself. Um, so you do want to um, to do that. And when the, that with that pressure pulling up, um, the tick will eventually release. Um, and if not, if the mouth parts come detached from the body, that's okay. Uh, once the, the mouth parts are detached from the body, it can no longer, um, for most diseases, it can no longer be transmitted because, again, it's in the tick's belly. Um, and it would just be like if you had the mouth part still in your skin, it would be like having a splinter or something um, in your skin. So you'd want to watch, keep a close eye on that area where the bite was, and um, just to make sure that you're not getting a secondary infection. If you care to use a tick key, um, we well, we're not open to the public yet. We do sell the tick keys, but you can get these at any of the sporting goods stores as well. Um, again, outdoor stores. Um, sometimes I think even the supermarket has them. Um, sometimes you'll find them. There's a, a the, the the tick twister they call them. They look like a little hook. Um, we have this one that's a flat surface on one side, and you're going to put the tick center. The um, I'm sitting here pointing to the pictures. If you can see me, sorry. Um, I don't want to move my mouth. Okay, so um, if you can follow my arrow, you're going to put the tick in the center of the opening, and then you're going to slide the tick key back until the tick's mouth parts are in this tiny uh, end part here. And just as it catches there, then you're just going to lift the tick and the key upward so that it releases that way. The body of the tick is um, being supported by this end here. So that's the best way to pull it out. And then that way you can put one of these on your key ring. You have it with you. You don't have to worry about trying to find tweezers or you lost tweezers in the car when you're out, um, works on pets. It's a little, it can be a little tricky sometimes with the really tiny ones. Um, so you might still want tweezers once you get back in the house, but if you feel you need to get this off and need to get it off now, the better. Um, so that's, uh, the key is one way to do that. And um, I'm going to be coming up to questions, so if you have any questions, go ahead and start typing them in. For tick ID, if you, you know, what do you do now that you have the tick? If you, um, and most of the time we do this for Ocean County, but if you are from another county, um, since right now we're doing everything through photographs, we are not taking samples in at the office, you're more than welcome to send, um, uh, we can tap Patty, I'll put in uh, the chat or in the Q&A our email addresses. You can send them to the office, send your photographs to the office. Let us know where you're from, put your name on there, um, and uh, we can ID the ticks just so we have an idea of um, where we are because maybe we'll see a tick that we're not expecting. And if you're from Minnesota sending me pictures or something, I need to know so that I, there may be a different tick in your area that that tick uh, may be. So. Um, but in normal situations, when we are able to identify in person, you can place the tick in a sealed container, a baggie, or clean medicine bottle with a little moist paper towel. Doesn't matter if the tick's alive. If you want to keep it alive, the idea, um, the moisture will help keep that humidity going for the tick. Um, don't place it on tape or store it in alcohol unless you want to kill the tick. Uh, placing it on tape makes it difficult to, for us to look at under the scope or even people that take pictures, they put it on tape and it's hard for us to actually identify when uh, even from photographs and emails. Um, the alcohol, if you use alcohol, some people will use alcohol in the removal. It can alter the blood. Um, so if you decide to get the tick tested, it may cost you more. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Um, there's also... Um, this link in here, the tickapp.org, I believe you can take pictures of the tick um, and that will also um, use that uh, picture, um, facial recognition or whatnot, tick recognition in this case, uh, in order for them to um, help ID the tick for you. So that's another way to do it if you're out on the on the road and you don't have a way to, to get the pictures to us. Um, but the, for tick testing, you do need to mail out the uh, tick to a lab. The doctors, a lot of people say, does a doctor, um, does a doctor do this? Does a, um, you know, do, will the doctor test the tick? No, um, most uh, doctors are testing human stuff, not animal or insect, excuse me, um, insect or arachnids in this particular case. Um, they're not testing them. So, um, but the other thing is, is just because a tick is positive for disease does not mean disease transmission has occurred. 
And also, if it tests negative, but you're experiencing flu-like symptoms, consult your physician. You may have been bitten by a different tick. So sometimes, you know, tick testing is, is oh, it's great, and, and it helps with those people that may be very anxious about it and just want to know. So it's good there, but it isn't a 100%, you know, you, you might have had another tick and you didn't realize it. Um, but tick, um, again, any kind of early detection uh, or just being aware will help you in the long run. The sooner you can get things, um, if you do wind up with Lyme or you do wind up with a disease, uh, that obviously early detection is the key and early um, intervention for you uh, will not have as long lasting effects in the long run. Okay. Um, so again, this is just a picture of some of the pictures that come into us. Um, sometimes we'll get the you know, picture like that, and it's kind of hard for us to take uh, to uh, understand what we're looking at, even if we blow it up and add light. Um, sometimes it is difficult. Um, but uh, what we are looking for as clear as possible on the top of the tick, and then we do ask for if you flip the tick over, so we can see the underneath the anal region, so that that will help us with our identification, or at least give us an extra, extra bit of oomph to help us identify that tick. Um, this is my email, but I know Patty will put that in there um, as we're going. And okay, so before we get into the diseases, are there any other, I'm just checking our time here, okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, there's, there's a bunch that popped up. Um, okay. I'll just go Anything for it, there? all right? That's fine, go for it. <clears throat> All right, so treatment for your yard if you have a dog. I don't think you talked about, you talked about tick dragging and don't I spray didn't. if you don't have mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you know of a way to treat if you do have ticks. So if you do have ticks, um, we do have a sheet. I didn't include it in here because the talk, trust me, when I do this talk for my master gardeners, it's three hours. So there's a lot more things that can that can be put in here. Um, but prevention for the yard or any kind of sprays that you can do, there is a, um, it's called management and we have it in the office. We can definitely attach that um, to the uh, email that can go out with the link. Um, about managing ticks in your yard or on your property. And there are correcting tick habitat. So if you have a lot of leaves that pile up against plants where mice might hide or shed where mice or um, smaller animals, rodents might be, um, getting rid of those habitats will definitely help without you having to spray. Also, um, you know, one of the things that people don't it's not as easy to do as to fence in your yard so that the deer can't roam through um, where you don't have that that moving population that can constantly uh, bring ticks or take ticks. Um, so that would be something. But as to a spray, I'd actually have to look and see which ones would be pet friendly. Um, a lot of the spray, I shouldn't say a lot, some of the sprays that you can use, um, there's a few that are for homeowners. Most of them are professional uh, grade. So you would have to have a licensed um, sprayer to do that. So um, there are a few homeowner versions that you, um, again, follow the labels. I don't have one in front of me or I would read it for you. But I believe as long as the product is dried on the grounds or on the area where you sprayed, uh, you should be good. The other thing is, is don't spray the whole yard. If it doesn't need to be sprayed in the middle, only target the outer edges or edges where you think mice might be, things like that. So, so there are ways to um, limit the contact that maybe a pet would have or a child would have. So if you send us your email, we can definitely get that information out to you in case I forget. Okay. Um, the next one is about the tick life cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's a long question, but basically if a life cycle can be a couple years, Mm -hmm. Like how long does it take from egg to larva and larva to nymph? Like, does that depend on if they find a host to, to feed on or? So some of it's the host. Some of it is um, once they feed, they kind of like go dormant and kind of like or hibernate, I guess is the best way. So it could be, uh, there is a great, I don't have it in this shot because again, I was trying to limit my time, um, but there is a shot of, um, I believe the eggs, let's say, that, let's just say the eggs are hatching in the spring. You have a, a larva stage through um, late summer, 
they're hopefully getting some food and they're staying in that stage at that point. Um, and then they're hibernating, then they'll molt, so they'll come out as a, um, as a nymph. Um, and then they go through until the fall, they'll hibernate, finish in, in, you know, maybe a month or two. They may finish out their cycle the following spring after the winter, depending again on the species. And then they will molt into the adult and then finish their stage that way. Um, so they can, they can overwinter in certain stages, uh, different stages, excuse me. There's, an, I don't, I, I, that I'd have to really, I don't want to misspeak here. Um, they're not only, um, overwintering as eggs, they can overwinter in their different stages as well. And there is a really good cycle picture. I'll have to uh, see if I can find that. Um, and I can either pop that in or put it on Facebook and as one of the questions we can answer that way. And just, just to clarify, do they die immediately after laying eggs? Immediately? The ones that we had in our, our group, they were tired after laying, <laughs> they had <laughs> 1500 babies uh, or 5,000. Um, so do they immediately die? I don't know. I, I, I know that there are people that have studied this. I personally don't know the exact answer to that. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're expended. Their energy is done. They have no other purpose. They've laid their eggs. They've done their thing. They die. So again, how, how soon? I, I honestly could not tell you for sure. Also, their life cycle depends on how, if it's um, if it's really hot, dry season, they can go dormant faster or, or you know, go to sleep, go to hibernate. Um, and then once the conditions are, are right um, to go into their next stage if they need to. So sometimes the life cycle can be earlier or a little longer. Um, so the stages can change. Not change, but the life cycle can change. Okay, and let's do one more here. Can okay. salt be rubbed on to dislodge a tick from skin? So that's a home remedy. Uh, uh, I, I I really can't answer that to say uh, this, the intended use of salt is not to be rubbed on your body to get rid of ticks. <laughs> so I honestly can't tell you um, uh, the answer to that. I, that's the best way to say it. Uh, I don't know. You may try it if it works, but that's not something I can tell you um, how good that would be. But again, the, the same, the same. Let's just say it did work. The same principle would be: you are making, you're agitating the tick. You are maybe stopping, maybe the salt's drying it out because they need that humidity. Um, you were, are now stressing the tick out, or the trick is when the tick is stressed, it can expel their contents back in. So the same idea still uh, comes into play that it could regurgitate the issue and make the issue worse for you. Um, there are two more. I think we could do them quick. Okay, that's fine. Our Go ahead. Squirrel carriers are ticks. They can be carriers or ticks. Carriers of ticks. They can be. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> they can be. Um, most of the time, what we see in the literature and the research um, has been uh, the bigger carriers do tend to be the the reservoirs for the disease tend to be mm -hmm. the um, the mice and the deer. Um, not to say that they're the only ones that can be um, hosts, uh, but they're the only ones that I shouldn't say only. They are the ones that tend to be the bigger carriers of the disease themselves. Okay, and one more, which mm -hmm. possibly you're going to cover in the next section, but just in case, how does the tick transmit disease if the sucking, they're sucking blood out? Mm -hmm. How did it? How does the disease get in? Okay. I don't know if you're. So we're. No, but I will. I can expand on that. So that's great. Um, and okay. actually, if I have enough time, I have a video and it shows it perfect. It's kind of gross, but it's four minutes at the end. Uh, it's just hard to go back and forth. I, I haven't been able to embed it in my PowerPoint so we could watch it. So um, I will have that at the end. Um, and it's disgusting, but it's cool too at the same time. So, okay. All right. Okay. So then in any questions from there, Patty, we'll go. I forget how many power slides I've got going here, but we'll start to talk about disease. Um, so this... Um, this chart kind of, uh, I put this together to make it a little bit easier to understand which ticks give what disease or possibly could transmit these diseases. These are not to say that these, every one of these ticks that gets on your body is going to transmit this disease. It really, it depends on one, if that tick has it, um, and then feeding time and also a, um, just you know, your body, you know, it may get into you, but just like we see with this virus, some people are affected and some people are not. So there are some of those things that come into play. 
Um, so we'll start out with the American dog tick. Um, the big one that we tend to hear a lot about is the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. They also have renamed it to the Spotted Rickettsia Spotted Fever group. They've kind of grouped all the spotted fevers together. Um, I don't really, I'm not really sure why it got the name Rocky Mountain, um, but the spotted fever does um, tend to have a rash at the wrists and the feet. Um, and the transmission time can be kind of uh, as a little quicker on this because the American dog ticks and the uh, brown dog tick actually carry can carry this disease and they carry it on their mouth parts on their body and it can be transmitted from the mother if the mother has it on their uh, body uh, can be transmitted to the egg so it is one of those oddballs compared to everybody else this is one of those diseases that um, the, the tick only needs to be feeding uh, or on you for about 10 hours approximately. If you had an open wound and the guy's hanging out there in your wounds, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a little faster transmission than and actually going and finding a, a space and inserting those mouth parts and creating the wound, which is then the entry point for the disease. So, um, or for the bacteria. Um, tularemia, we don't see very often. I do have some stats about some of these diseases and how they are in Ocean and Monmouth counties. Uh, but tularemia is called rabbit fever. Um, it is something that you can get from soil and rabbits, uh, outdoor rabbits. So um, it is something that kind of it doesn't happen very often, but it is possible it could happen. And tick paralysis, I put that in there because um, we do hear some stories. There was a story a couple of years ago on Facebook that a young girl, six years old, was suddenly paralyzed. They couldn't, they took it. They found a, uh, a an engorged tick behind her ear, an American dog tick female. They pulled it off and about 12, uh, I think it was eight to 12 hours later, the child was back to normal. It happens a lot with dogs. Um, so uh, sometimes you'll find it around, tends to be around the neck area that the tick is found. Um, and once the tick is removed, the paralysis, uh, the paralysis goes away. So it's not something to worry extensively um, that I know of or that I've seen in the research, but it is something to keep in mind. So really on um, the American dog tick, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is our big one. And I say big, but again, it's relative when you see the numbers, when we get into the numbers. The black-legged deer tick, the BLT, the BLT carries a cocktail. So, uh, <laughs> yes, food references at this time of night. Um, but in any case, um, the black-legged tick, Lyme disease, anisplasmosis, and babesiosis are the three big ones. Um, they can all be present in the tick, and the tick at one tick can give you all three at the one time. Or you there could be any combination or individual of any of these. Lyme disease is still the most um, common disease um, that is reported to the CDC or by the CDC. Um, the statistics that I have, uh, the Lyme disease is still the most prevalent tick disease, uh, tick-borne disease. That um, that's why you hear so much about Lyme disease. But these other diseases can play a big part if they're not caught early enough. Um, anisplasmosis uh, is another blood disease. Oops. Anisplasmosis is another blood disease, and babesiosis is actually a protozoan. So they use a something like an anti-malaria drug, I believe, to combat that versus the um, doxycycline. And again, I'm not medical, so talk to your family doctor if you have more questions about that. Um, but the last one, oh, uh, I put Powassan in here as well because that played uh, New York in 19, 18, 19, 2018, 2019. That was a big disease that was out there. Um, I think we had four cases in New Jersey, but in the whole United States, I think there were 25 or 26 cases. So it's not that common, but it was like, wow, when it hit, it was wow. So um, I got the POW, but uh, they call it the Powell, Powell, the, the Powassan. So it is something, again, is it that common? No, but it is something, again, another one of those diseases. Lone star tick, again, this is the type of tick that we see um, through uh, through New Jersey, it's very common. Um, ehrlichiosis is one of the diseases uh, that we are most um, that associated uh, with the Lone Star. And then the other one for here in um, New Jersey or in the Northeast is the um, uh, meat allergy, the alpha gal. Now people are finding this not necessarily where anywhere that Lone Stars can be found, which is um, uh, again, from the southern states uh, on up here on the east coast and somewhat out into the plains, but not super far in the real cold areas just yet. Uh, but Tula, I mean, uh, excuse me, the meat, the meat allergy, the alpha gal syndrome um, is a protein and allergy that the tick's saliva 
creates in you. It's a um, it's a reaction to when you have meat and the um, protein, this alpha gal uh, galactose protein, um, is your body reacts to it. So it could be anywhere from um, it's a food allergy, so a food based allergy or like a bee sting. So some people could have a very mild reaction to it. And other people could have an anaphylactic shock. It's not that common, but it does happen. It can happen in small children and adults. So can you grow out of it? Possibly. Um, they're still doing a lot of research on this. And because it's an allergy, we can't say if this tick's going to give you that. It's your body's reaction to the saliva. So um, just like with bees, you know, you may not be allergic to bees, but maybe in later in life you do become one. So the more that you are bitten by a lone star tick, you know, these are some things you want to keep in mind. Um, with the meat allergy, I, I, people ask a lot about it, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. Um, the meat allergy is something that um, I've been told about three to six hours after eating meat is when people seem to notice that there can be a reaction. Um, so it could be hives, could be trouble breathing, just knowing that you're having a allergic reaction to something. You may not know what it is, um, but kind of just keeping that in your back of your mind that, oh, wait, I just had a hamburger, um, something like that. So um, if you're worried, uh, we had a client that came in and, and they were saying, you know, they're worried about their child being allergic to red meat after being bitten by a lone star. Um, you know, if if that is a concern, uh, something that was suggested to her was not to have the child eat meat too close to bedtime so that you're able to watch the child and see if the child does have a, a reaction. Um, again, um, sometimes it's a buildup. The more you're bitten by a lone star tick, the more you know you might have this buildup to the alpha gal. The way that you would determine whether you have that disease, or excuse me, that allergy, excuse me, that's an allergy, um, would be to uh, seek a dermatologist and uh, and ask them if they can do a test for you to see about that. Um, Starry, I have Starry and Heartland virus. Um, those are uh, two. Um, the Starry is a, a rash, and the Heartland virus, I forget, so I won't go into it, but <laughs> they are found more in the uh, center and southern states, um, and they're more prevalent down south. But with so many people traveling, when we're back to traveling fully, um, that we may start seeing some of these viruses move or be reported more in the northern states. Not that we have any of these, uh, the Lone Star ticks that have this, uh, they haven't found any here up in the northeast as far as I understand, that have these diseases, but it is something that might be up and coming in the future for us to be worried about. Right now, now ehrlichiosis is the big one here. And again, I'll go over some of the, um, some of the numbers just so you have an idea and put things into perspective for you. Uh, engorge, so we do talk a lot about engorgement. What does engorge mean? So uh, engorgement means that if it's fully engorged, it's full of blood. So that means that the tick has been feeding. Now there's um, the tick report company has, um, or not company, but the tick report uh, website has a great um, shot of ticks from I believe one day to seven days for an adult tick, and you can see how much one, you know, as it's feeding, you can see how big these pick, these ticks can get. So when we see an engorged tick, we know it's been on long enough to possibly pass on disease if it has one to pass on. So again, the importance um, is the disease causing organisms may be expelled during feeding. So ticks, they use their mouth parts, the histoma, the part that actually goes in your skin and basically it has these little barbs and it cuts your skin and inserts itself in there. So it creates like a little blood pool. And so it more sips um, your blood than it does, um, you know, actually actively kind of pulling it out of the skin. But what happens is the longer that they're feeding, as that blood goes through the digestive system, it can come back out and kind of regurgitate just like at a straw. You know how sometimes you don't want to be drinking out of your children's a straw or their soda. Um, you don't know what's floating in that soda. Well, there you go. Same idea with the tick. It's disgusting, but yes, the same idea with the tick. So um, that's how the tick, that's how the diseases can go from the tick's gut into you because it can get mixed. So the longer it's on, the more likely that that um, interaction is going to happen. And then that's why it becomes more of a, a the, um, a question or not a question, but that's why it's more of a concern when we see these big fat ticks. It's like, woof, well, that's been on long enough. And uh, I wish I had time to show you the, the actual pictures, but I have some great um, 
videos, we can always do another one. If you guys have questions, I can always send you stuff individually too. So, um, but disease transmission, um, I forgot to put this in before. So um, I did a talk for Department of uh, Public Works um, uh, last week actually. And I was like, oh, they asked about transmission times till they forgot. But the medium minimum feeding times for possible transmission, and this is about average. You're always gonna have that one person that, or it seems like you always have those exceptions to the rules, but for Rocky Mountain spotted fever is the minimum of 10 hours attachment and feeding. Um, anisplasmosis, babies, and it doesn't have to be, sorry for the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it does not have to be attached, but generally some kind of, some way for that bacteria to get into a wound or into the, under the skin um, is necessary. So that's why 10 hours tends to be the average time for that. 24 hours for anisplasmosis, babesiosis, and ehrlichiosis, and 36 to 48 hours for Lyme disease. Now, again, can I look at this picture of this tick up here in the right-hand corner um, and say how long that that's been feeding by just looking at it? No, I can't. The flatter the tick, the less likely, the less time it's been on. The fatter the tick, like here, um, this is, uh, this looks well, let's just say it's, I can't really tell what kind of tick it is. It's so bloated. Um, but let's just say that's a lone star tick, an adult female. It's not, but if it was, um, seeing one tick like that, that, that large, she could have been on there for seven days um, and feeding. So to be that fat and that engorged. Um, usually when they fully feed like that, that's when they drop off and then they're um, do, going into egg production. They use that blood to then produce their eggs. So again, the exceptions down here at the bottom, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever and the meat allergy can be transmitted through insertion of the mouth parts and tick saliva um, respectively with those two diseases. And um, okay, it's a little tiny, I apologize, but uh, this is the best I could do to kind of give you an idea of some stats. So here's the black-legged tick. Um, these are stats that I gathered from 2016, 2018 from the New Jersey government health, uh, health, New Jersey's health, sorry, um, for communicable disease report. Um, so I've gone through and you'll see statewide, let's just start with Babesiosa real quick. Um, statewide in 2016, there's 174 cases that were confirmed um, Babesiosis. In Ocean County of those 174 cases, 25 of them were in Ocean County, 24 of them were in Monmouth County. So that's how you would go to this chart. Um, so here's babesiosis. Let's just uh, stay with Ocean County and we'll go across the line here. I'm going to go in 2018 because the numbers were a little higher as we went in. Um, babesiosis in Ocean County was 15 out of 249 cases statewide. Anisplasmosis, um, it was 118 statewide cases, but only eight of them were found in Ocean or were, were diagnosed in Ocean County. Lyme disease. Out of the 4,000 cases, 290 were in Ocean County, 506 were in Monmouth County. So um, just to kind of give you that perspective, you can see why Lyme disease is talked about so much more. So 4,000 cases uh, in statewide for the black-legged tick. Um, the, um, the next closest was the babesiosis at 249 statewide. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever at 147. And then here's the Lone Star uh, that comes in at, in the last, so to speak, uh, with 94 cases of this um, Ehrlichiosis. There are two, you'll see these names up here. It's Ehrlichiosis, I believe it's called. Um, they are the actual um, bacteria, the name's bacteria that causes the diseases, um, and they can cause, they can cause two separate things, but they kind of lump them together and call it ehrlichiosis as a whole. Um, so you can see that 94 people statewide had it. So really, again, that's why Lyme star, or excuse me, that's why Lyme disease is the big contender. Um, and we're they're still looking into whether is it, you know, even though we don't see as many Lone Star ticks, uh, excuse me, as many deer ticks that come into us for identification or that we see that many people that have it, it seems to be able to be transmitted easier. Maybe because the ticks are smaller, you don't see them um, and they're on there longer, so they have more chance of transmitting versus the Lone Star. We see so many more Lone Star, um, but for whatever reason, uh, the, the disease is, is not transferred as much. So they're still looking into research as to why that is. And um, there are some people at Rutgers. I know that there's a, a couple of, um, Biologists, uh, Mike, uh, 
oh my gosh, the disease, I forget the, sorry. Um, I know Joe, Jim Ochi from, uh, he was formerly with Rutgers and he's uh, in a separate lab now, but here in New Jersey, um, has doing a lot of research about um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever here in New Jersey and the Lone Star is just talking about that some of these different diseases. So it is on the, um, it is on their radar to go look into what's going on. Um, okay, so if you have one, some more information about that we can certainly get some more information the 2020 um report was not available when i made this so um i'm sure or not 2020 excuse me 2019 they're like a year and a half behind um the 2019 oh no i lied the 2019 was on here but i couldn't get it on this chart but the 2020 was not available and i do believe with um uh, if we do get to see that one, it'll be sometime late August before we'd be able to see some of the numbers and see. I would assume it's going to be down, but that's an assumption. I shouldn't assume. So um, just because we were not as actively uh, outside and, and um, out and about in our environment in most cases. So, okay. Um, so just two slides on tick and pets, ticks uh, with pets. And I think we're getting, oh, we're just a little over time there. So I apologize. I'll just finish this up real quick. Um, Tick-borne diseases are very prevalent in this area for Ocean and Monmouth counties. And the three main diseases for pets, Lyme, Ehrlichiosis, and Anasplasmosis. Um, Alpha-gal is not seen in pets at the moment. Um, so there's still some research being done on that. But Lyme, Ehrlichiosis, and Anasplasmosis are three diseases that dogs uh, and cats, but generally dogs can get. Most uh, vets will test for these diseases in conjunction with the annual heartworm test, if you ask. Um, the clinical signs can be very vague. So, you know, maybe the dog's not feeling well, uh, lethargic, decreased, decreased appetite, or sh uh, shifting lame legness because of um, lame legness, sorry, uh, shifting leg lameness. So it goes from one leg to another leg to another leg. And that could be uh, because of the joint pain and inflammation. Um, and we want to thank uh, Dr. Race here from Bayshore Veterinary Hospital that helped us with um, some of the. Uh, answers about the pets and what to do. So um, here's where we talk about a little bit of Lyme vaccines that are available for pets, but it's uh, as a topical or an oral tick preventatives, but use topical and oral tick preventatives as well because the ticks can carry other disease. There is a Lyme vaccine. Again, whether you want to speak with the veterinarian to see whether your dog um, or your pet would be eligible because there is uh, age issues um, and certain species cannot get the Lyme vaccine. Um, but no vaccine, there is no vaccine for lechiosis or anosmosis. Uh, be aware of the inexpensive over-the-counter flea and tick as they are associated with seizures in some dogs. So um, you want to, you know, talk to your vet if you have concerns about that. Oral medication, oral meds are more effective than the topical medicines. Again, check with your vet, which is best for your pet and for the safety of your pet and the age. Never use a dog product on a cat. And vets do not regularly test cats. The cats just, well, we all know cats have their own, <laughs> their own um, personalities and mine has not come by today. Uh, she must be outside. So um, I wanted, you know, uh, the cats uh, are, I don't want to say immune, but they they have other issues, <laughs> as we know, if we've ever been bitten by one. Uh, but cats don't seem to get any ad adverse clinical signs from tick-borne disease. And that is, uh, again, thank you to Dr. Uh, Racer um, that uh, gave us that information. Um, so that's my main part. So if there's any questions, I know we went over a little bit. So if there's any questions, Patty, go ahead and go, and then we can put the, I'll put the uh, video on. Um, just two quick ones here. The first one, I know we're not medical, so we're not going to really discuss any symptoms mm -hmm. and things, but in general, so the question is, what would some early detection signs be of illness? Okay, so again, and this would be something we do tell people, um, we have a one page, just a quick um, center disease, oh wait, here we go, center disease control for disease information, the cdc.government.gov, um, you can look up for tick information, uh, but fever, chills, headaches, uh, achy joints, um, rash is not every disease has rash, even the Lyme disease, 70% um, of people get the rash. 30% do not. Um, we also have, uh, you know, some story, uh, not stories, I shouldn't give stories, but we do have somebody that um, I know personally that ha was diagnosed with Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they never knew they were bitten by a tick. Um, so talk to your doctor if you have symptoms um, of something and you don't know. Um, if you are outdoors, 
you know, maybe it's something you want to get tested. So you have a baseline, make sure that you don't have it this year um, and then get tested if you should feel that you have issues. With COVID, we all know that achy joints, the virus, it, it attacks, it, you know, it's going to be kind of hard um, to get that. But you do want to talk to talk it over. Your doctor will know more better of you, uh, no, more better, will know of your history better uh, and be able to hopefully um, combat that. There are some, some doctors will be prophylactic uh, and, and uh, prescribe an antibiotic, of course, of antibiotic. Uh, some doctors really don't want to treat unless there's symptoms because, again, if you have your antibiotics, um, you can become more immune and then down the road there could be more issues, especially on younger children. Um, and the doxycycline kind of can hit a good punch, uh, can really knock out your good fauna in your body as well. So uh, that was just more of a side note. Sorry, that's not medical tested. Uh, sorry, I'll stop there. All right, go ahead, Patty. <laughs> okay. Um, this is going back a little bit. How long does it take for the tick to go from engorged back to regular size? Uh, I don't know. I, I never saw that in in um, in any of the research that I did because it really wasn't that important because it going from engorged to not engorged to going from nymph, it uses that blood to then go and make and molt into its next stage. So it needs that it uses that blood source so i honestly couldn't tell you i i i just really can't say um there is a really okay. cool i have to find it there is a really cool video of ticks having sex if anybody cares to see it but if you want to see that maybe um it's a scientist that did this study to see how these things actually work and how they the that uh and i believe he may have something about that and has followed the life cycle all the way through so. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, just the thing um, we want to do for tonight. <laughs> Late night yeah, watching. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so, is there a human Lyme vaccine? Uh, Got to check with a medical doctor. I honestly can't answer that. I don't know that there is one yeah. that is how effective and everybody's different. Everybody's body's different. Right. So, you definitely want to yeah, talk I with mean, your I provider. Know Rufus gets one, but I don't know anything about human. I know that there is one out there. I believe it, but pulled it because they don't believe it was as effective as it was supposed to be. So I honestly, that's about as far as I can tell you. Um, I'm sure if I looked into it more, but again, that's more medical than I'm prepared to speak about or to speak on. Um, there's another question. It's medical, but I'll mm -hmm. read it to you. If you get Lyme's disease and take the antibiotics, does, the, does this eliminate the disease for life? from the bite or are there lingering effects? Um, what little I know again uh, about that uh, part of it is that the Lyme disease, uh, it, I don't wanna say it's in remission because I, I know my terminology is not correct, um, but the, the antibodies for the Lyme disease is still there. Um, so if you were bitten by another Lone Star, I mean, uh, another deer tick, um, could you get a flare up of it and the disease? Yes, you can get Lyme disease again. That part I know. Um, I don't know anything else more than that. And I, I just don't feel comfortable speaking about that. Okay, so we're just saying thank you and great, okay. very informative, great PowerPoint. Okay. Um, Claudia right. really likes the pictures, they're very clear. Okay. I agree. Good. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. You can still talk. I'm going to stop sharing so I can get that video uh, uh, queued on here and see. Um, so if you guys want to see it, it's really cool. And I just got to find out what screen it's on. It should be this one. Okay. So if you guys are ready, if there's no other questions, if you still have questions and you're still hanging on after four minutes, uh, we'll, we'll I'll stay on and answer questions. Um, so and I'll make this big screen once I get this going. Okay. Can you hear it, Patty? Um, no, I don't hear anything. I can see it. I don't hear it. I wonder if it's because you have headphones on.
no volume. I can't hear you, Sue. Okay, sorry. I mute, I forgot I muted myself and then I couldn't find it. <laughs> now, could you see the, you could see the closed caption though, right? Yes. Okay. I was like, you didn't stop me. So I assumed it was good. So, I mean, so if you guys, you know, if you really want a copy of that video, it is a YouTube video. Um, you can, you can check it out and, um, it really just kind of helps illustrate what a tick does and gives you a little bit more information than I can show you in a PowerPoint. Um, so were there any more questions that might be popping up? I, nothing. In no, I don't see anything else. Just some thank yous and great info and.
Okay. Oh, I see Teresa's up at the top. Uh, so I want to uh, thank yeah. everybody for attending tonight. I see Teresa made it. To, like I said, Teresa was uh, one of our assistants in the office. So she is one of the people that when you do call in and ask questions, uh, she's one of the people that uh, will be uh, that can answer the phone as well. Uh, and then um, if you'd like to send us emails to Patty or myself, we can do that. And again, once we stop this video, there's Teresa. Um, once we uh, stop the video, um, or stop recording, you guys can then take the survey if you have any other questions in there or you're looking for more information, let us know, email us and uh, we'll get that information out. But I really appreciate that uh, your attention this evening and um, thank you. Um, someone's asking for the YouTube link so we can okay. probably put yep. that in. So let me go back to my PowerPoint and it should be, so let me just, Start it from here. Oh, fudge. How do we do that? <laughs> so I could even send it to the attendees if if you wanted to. Yeah, but I can also put it there. We go. It's um. So go. if you just want to Google it, how ticks dig in with a mouthful of hooks will actually bring it up. Um, but that's okay. the YouTube uh, video. Um, and there is the U T U dot B E. Don't ask me why it's there, but that is, and apparently the spacing is there too. When I uh, that's how I got however it's up there on the screen but we can also send it out um i don't believe that's on our resource page but we can definitely put that out in email so yeah but it's just kind of it's really disgusting but cool at the same time <laughs> for those buggy people like me those geeks yeah <laughs> so all right any other questions in particular patty are we good i think we're good all right no. well like i said Amazing thank you guys thank you um uh, and and you know well, we'll be ready for our gardening uh, gardening guide no guide to growing beautiful roses uh, in, on the 16th of weeks. May. Yep, 16th yep. of May. So come join us then, and then we'll start getting into uh, rain barrels or after that in June. So we'll do rain barrels, and then we'll start getting into the veggies and a couple other things that'll be coming along uh, in July. So thank you everybody. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to respond to any of the emails that you've been getting with these, um, with the videos, with the links, and just uh, we'll, we will get the information to you. Just let us know what you need. And thanks everybody. Have a great night. Very good. Thank maybe, you. Maybe you can thank eat you. now. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay, I'm gonna try and get out of.